This video has been sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Any casual viewer of my morning show would probably tell you that I'm a fan of keeping the evil eyes of the corporate overlords out of my business, which means I'm a big fan of VPNs. Surfshark VPN secures your data with industry-leading measures by using uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols, and provides IP and DNS leak protection so that nobody can find where you're connecting from. But the best part is, Surfshark also allows you to unlock 15 largest Netflix country libraries libraries, including the US and Japan, by merely connecting to a server in the right country. It even addresses a problem that I've encountered personally. With Surfshark Alert, get immediate alerts if your personal information appears in leaked databases. One subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices at the same time. There are apps for all platforms, 24-7 live customer support, 30-day money-back guarantee, and Surfshark doesn't keep user data. Search in complete privacy with no ads or trackers following your every move. Use the code LITERATURE to get an 83% discount and three extra months for free. Check out the link in the description below to find out more. So, you want to write a story. <laughs> I mean, let's do it. The question, where to begin, has haunted many a fledgling writer about as often as the question of how to begin. One could argue that in the world of writing, there are very few things more intimidating than gazing into the abyss of the blank page and its infinite possibility. And then, once the journey begins, the challenge of forging a story that will, at the very least, hold your reader's attention and, at best, be held among the greats soon arises. And this only happens if one can overcome the nightmarish fear of exposing one's work to the hungry, hungry masses and having your heart gouged by harsh, negative feedback. The unfortunate the unfortunate result is stagnation. People who want to write but never do because their ideas are supposedly not good enough. People who want to start writing but never finish because their story never reaches a certain idea of perfection. People who finish a project but never publish because one rejection was simply one too many. But in an era where once popular media has been overwhelmed by ego-driven hacks and screechy activists, independent and creator-owned media is just as or even more important today than any other time in recent history. And so everyone who's ever had the dream of publishing a novel and being whisked away into the land of fame and fortune has tried their hand at independent publishing, otherwise known as indie publishing. Suddenly, the delicious temptation of unleashing one's work while skipping the rejection letters and the brutal pen of the editor becomes far too enticing to reject. The unfortunate result here being a biblical deluge of independent media flooding the market. Media created by amateurs, fortune seekers, and delicate artists who see critique as insult while muttering something about how the world just doesn't understand their genius, or how much they deny objectivity in art or something. And so, while we may be hit with a wave of new creator-controlled media, untouched by the grotesque fetid hands of the corporate taskmaster, this also means we have been hit by a wave of media that has subverted not only our expectations, but professional quality control. In other words, the stories often range from barely readable garbage to alright, with the odd diamond awaiting its eventual grand discovery. While most of the craft is still up to the creator, I've put together a list of guidelines that will help you decide both where and how to begin. Now the next question you might have is, where did these rules come from? There are numerous books, videos, and lectures out there for any writing hopeful to consume, advice on improving one's craft, plots, and characters, the philosophy behind it, or literary devices like allegory and motif. And while all of these things can range from useful to critical, the following rules are meant to be a practical set of suggestions for story construction targeted at those new to writing and or looking to throw their hats into the ring of independent publishing. And as to where did these rules come from, the answer of course is that the following rules developed from a result of my dive into independent media. In other words, the following list was made specifically to address many common flaws and mistakes commonly made by unseasoned authors and what they could have done to create a solid groundwork for story. Also, it should be noted that the craft and quality still rely heavily on the author, and that the following rules will not necessarily guarantee success. The overall purpose is to mainly point out some of the major pitfalls commonly made by both new and professional creator alike. Hey, look, I just want to get started so I can finally finish that novel I've been dreaming of writing. What's the first thing I need to know? Rule 1. Know your audience. Audience. Just like many of these suggestions, each could possibly be a discussion on its own. But to summarize, the one rule for many writer hoping to make a living telling stories, even before you write your first word, is to know who exactly you're writing for. And while this point might seem obvious, this has been a major issue devastating the Star Wars fandom. Especially after the advent of The Last Jedi, most notably its insultingly destructive depiction of the central hero of the series, Luke Skywalker. Fans for decades had seen Luke Skywalker as the optimistic hero who saved the galaxy from the evil empire. And 
redeemed his once evil father. So when The Last Jedi brought a depressed Luke Skywalker who would rather murder his own nephew in his sleep at the drop of a hat with no adequate explanation as to why, much of the Star Wars audience was rightfully furious. But it wasn't so much about the fall of the once righteous hero, it was how the new depiction of Luke, as presented, failed to respect the legacy of the character. Had the writers remembered who they were writing for, and still wanted to give us a fallen Luke Skywalker, they would have put more focus detailing a logical and character consistent story, telling us exactly how Luke fell so far. This is highly likely why the Mandalorian television show was showered with fan affection when it gave a positive heroic depiction of Luke Skywalker. The show remembered who its audience was, and gave proper deference to the legacy of the most iconic character in Star Wars history. But the following question might be, that's all well and good, but what if I'm just getting started? Well the simple answer is, genre. Romance, fantasy, sci-fi, horror. Each genre comes with its own unique elements and expectations. Sci-fi readers might crave spaceships, androids, and aliens while fantasy fans might expect brave young heroes with magical swords rescuing maidens from vicious dragons. Romance enthusiasts want to see two people fall in love, see the young college girl make her fateful choice between the charming billionaire's son or the wounded bad boy. Satisfy your audience with a story they enjoy and they will listen to what you have to say. Okay, I know what my audience will be. What do I do now? Rule 2. Identify the story. Once again, this piece of advice might seem like common sense. Of course you intend to write a story. That's your entire goal as a storyteller. But identifying the story of one's story has proven to be a greater challenge than one might initially realize, especially amongst inexperienced writers and especially amongst sci-fi and fantasy. However, any writer can unfortunately fall prey to this unfortunate pitfall. Why? This is where the same passion pushing you to create can potentially lead to a potential downfall. How? The simple answer is information overload. As Patrick Rothfuss, author of The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear put it, it's easy for an author to get so caught up in the details of the world they created that they go off the rails and give us more than is really necessary for the story. Writers often find themselves in the position of world builder, and it's exciting. A whole new universe to build, an infinite space in which to build it. But this is exactly the part that can lead writers astray. In short, some writers mistake developing sensational elements for the world with the developing a story. For example, a fantasy writer might lose themselves in the history of a kingdom or the mechanics of their magical system. It might be intriguing to craft a magical system that requires the user to surrender their soul in exchange for power. While this might sound dramatic, it isn't a story. A story has a beginning, middle, and end. The story would follow the young farm boy as he loses his family to a corrupt lord and surrenders his soul for power and revenge. Perhaps rather than giving us a dry recount of how the kingdom was founded by nomadic men who once killed a red dragon for his land and built the great castle on top of his bones, you could begin the story with a young farm boy hero watching his world taken away when a mysterious dragon begins attacking his people, eventually leading us to the revelation that this dragon is the lost son of the red dragon murdered by the nomad centuries earlier, which would prompt a plot relevant reason to recount that portion of the kingdom's history. In summary, the sensational elements, details, and mechanics aren't a story. Rather, they are potential building blocks of one. And the unfortunate truth is that while these elements might interest you as a creator, they won't necessarily be interesting to the reader until you properly attach them to a story. Alright, but how do I identify the story? Rule 3. Establish Conflict Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us dragons exist, but because they tell us dragons can be beaten. Neil Gaiman paraphrasing G.K. Chesterton, Conflict is the beating heart of story, the dragon, metaphorical or not, that our hero must eventually face. This can range from the valiant knight fighting a fire-breathing beast, to the romantic heroine solving the dreaded love triangle, to a man man sitting alone fighting his own inner demons, in which the dragon that must be conquered would be the very man himself. Most elements people adore about stories are born from its conflict. In fact, the moment your conflict is established could arguably be the moment your story truly begins. Joseph Campbell's famous monomyth revolves around conflict. What we call the hero's journey is sparked by a naive young character falling into conflict we call the inciting incident, and then maturing and changing to overcome it. How the character grows, learns, and conquers challenges along the way is the story the audience wants to hear. It's interesting to see Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender grow and mature from a fun-loving kid running from his responsibilities to a hero embracing his destiny. Watch him learn to control water, earth, and fire. Watch him struggle with the guilt he carried after abandoning the world for a hundred years. This is also likely why the skill of spirit bending drew the frustration of fans. Not simply because of its existence, but that Aang was given the ability instead of having to earn it. No conflict was overcome 
to achieve this new skill. Fortunately, the formula for conflict is fairly simple. In the words of Neil Gaiman, everything is driven by characters wanting different things, and by those different things colliding. Every moment that one character wants something, and the other character wants something mutually exclusive, and they collide, every time that happens, you have a story. The Fire Lord's ambition for global domination provided conflict for Aang, who wanted harmony between the nations, two characters wanting the opposite of the other. And Aang's character growth, along with all the adventures that occurred along the way, developed because of his journey to defeat the Fire Lord. What enemy must be slain? What mystery must be solved? What fear must be conquered? When constructing a story, begin with its central conflict and the remaining pieces will develop much easier. In the words of Batman writer Denny O'Neill, make me laugh, make me cry, tell me my place in the world, lift me out of my skin and place me in another, show me places I have never visited and carry me to the ends of time and space, give my demons names and help me confront them, demonstrate for me possibilities I've never thought of and present me with heroes who will give me courage and hope, ease my sorrows and increase my joy, teach me compassion, entertain and enchant and enlighten me, tell me a story. Okay, I have my conflict and story. Now how should I get started? Rule 4. Create a meaningful beginning. The beginning is one of the most critical points of a story, and not just because it sets narrative elements in motion, but because a writer often has the first chapter, the first page, possibly even the first paragraph, to interest the curious reader. Unfortunately, some writers see the start as more of a nuisance than a necessity, and sprint past the beginning towards the good stuff. But the harsh truth is that the good stuff is only good because the beginning gave it impact and meaning. Other writers are aware of the beginning's importance and try to immediately grasp the reader's attention with a popular trick called in medias res. In medias res is a Latin phrase meaning into the middle of things. What this means in writing terms is instant action. For example, we might begin with a fight scene or a chase, and the logic behind this is understandable. Put the exciting stuff first to interest your reader, but the reality is it isn't that easy. To think in medias res is a shortcut to an effective beginning is almost like choosing to write short stories over novels because short stories are by definition shorter and therefore must be easier. However, in writing, laziness rarely ever prevails. A short story might require fewer words than a novel, but it also requires the same elements as a novel, except now you have less time to do it. Novels may be longer, but they also allow the author room for detail and development, as opposed to the short story where one has little time to focus on anything else except for the plot. They're less of a lesser novel and more of an art all its own. Just like writing short stories, in medias res comes with its own advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is its potential to immediately grasp the audience's attention. The disadvantage, however, is that it too requires its own skill. Just as short stories aren't merely easy novels, In Medias Res is not merely an easy beginning. Contrary to popular belief, even the most explosive action can be boring. In fact, many writers fall prey to the idea that an In Medias Res beginning means action for action's sake, and lean only on the action to carry the audience through. Just like everything else included in your story, even an immediate rest starting point must have purpose and meaning. And because the audience doesn't know the full context or the stakes, even the most action-packed scene could still result in disinterest. The first John Wick movie begins with the title character battered and bruised as he's looking at recordings of his wife, giving us both a mystery and a hint as to why he's fighting. Indiana Jones is famous for sparking its grand adventure with the climax of another one. They also tend to be fairly effective, like the idol scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. We know that Jones wants the idol and that he's traversing a dangerous temple to do so. It's almost like a mini story on its own. Immediately, we know the goal, to capture the idol. And more importantly, the stakes, to succeed or die. The event also introduces to us the character of Indiana Jones and his world of violence, ancient mysteries, and betrayal. We even get introduced to Dr. Jones's fear of snakes, and all of this information is packed neatly into this in medias res beginning. Even if one had no idea who Indiana Jones was as a character or the world he lived in, most audience members would know everything they needed to know by the end of this segment. And in short, when it comes to in medias res, make it simple and give it substance. Additionally, a writer can never underestimate the power of an opening line. In fact, it's all too common to see compilations of what is considered to be the best lines in literary history. For example, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number 4 Pivot Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were
for Striking 13, 1984 by George Orwell. What opening lines tend to have in common is a built-in peculiarity. Or to put it another way, they ask a question. The Dursley's pride in being normal sparks the question, why would one take pride in being normal unless there's something abnormal we haven't seen yet? The clock striking 13 lets us know that something is off about the world of Winston Smith, since normal clocks only go to 12 and that the number 13 in some places is considered to be bad luck. Immediately, we get a sense that the world of Winston Smith is similar to our own, but just a little bit off. Almost like a horror movie. And so we ask, what else about this world differs from my own? People are hardwired to seek answers for questions, so if the opening line provides one, whether implicitly or explicitly, readers will be intrigued from line one. A personal favorite is the Franz Kafka technique used in the Metamorphosis. To quote, From Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into an enormous insect. We immediately want to learn how or why Gregor Samsa turned into an enormous insect. However, the real value of the technique is what happens afterward. We get a description of Samsa's new body, then there's a smooth transition into a description of the room. What this does is present us with an intriguing opening line, and then shies away from giving us the answers that we want, encouraging us to keep reading in order to find out these answers. A more modern example of this technique on display was used by Jack Reacher's author, Lee Child in the killing floor. I was arrested in Eno's diner. Again, we immediately ask, why was he arrested in a diner? What's the urgency? What did he do? What follows is a description of the diner and what he was doing up until his arrest. At 12 o'clock, I was eating eggs and drinking coffee. Again, we continue to read, desperate to find answers to the question posed by the opening line. And lastly, in the words of American writer and author of Slaughterhouse-Five, Kurt Vonnegut, start as close to the end as possible. How close to the end can you get and still have a satisfying story? This is especially true for short stories, but it can even be applied to grand epics. In the Lord of the Rings movies, we're given a prologue of war that took place roughly a thousand years before the main story. But the war doesn't lead to Sauron's final defeat. With the hero Isildur failing to destroy the heart of Sauron's power, the threat remained. The story of the Dark Lord's final defeat would arrive at the hand of Frodo Baggins' story. And so, our nice little prologue jumps ahead and the main story begins many years later. Now I have my opening. What about the story? Rule 5. Develop your craft. Developing one's craft is not only key to maintaining the audience's interest, but also properly weaving in meaning and message. Incidentally, this is the element of writing that certain critics and commentators say doesn't exist. The school of canon doesn't matter. The school of fiction means you can do whatever you want. The school of all art is subjective. While it is true that when writing fiction, it's your world to create, but part of world building and story craft is crafting the framework of the world. And once these rules are set, the writer must adhere to these rules. To once again quote Patrick Rothfuss, once I explain the framework to you, if my characters are clever using the framework, then you can appreciate their cleverness at a different depth. And it's very satisfying. You can't get the same satisfaction in a world that does not have a cohesive, understandable, and explicit system. For example, the beating heart of popular anime series Death Note were the rules of the Death Note. Under what circumstances could its user kill and what restrictions? Knowing the framework and sticking to it drove the gripping tension for which the series would become famous. With a cohesive, understandable, and explicit system, the game of wits between Killer Light and Detective L could have never made such a tense and satisfying one to behold. But unfortunately, many modern works have been corrupted by the modern art ideal. That message and theme overshadow all else, even craft and quality. That despite its shapeless form and its grotesque and nonsensical appearance, a story must be good because warning may contain themes. Or that it's trying to say something. In other words, the simple presence of message and theme, the art portion of the art, is supposedly all that counts, and that it all counts the same, regardless of how unstable the narrative. But comparing good craft to poor is like comparing a mumbling speaker to a star orator. Both can be set to deliver the greatest messages in the world, but the speaker who has perfected his speech craft will deliver said message far more effectively. To quote the author of Sandman and Coraline, Neil Gaiman, craft is as important as art, because if you get the craft right, the art will follow. Art follows craft, because a well-crafted story normally makes for good storytelling regardless of theme, while rudely patching the holes of one sinking narrative with themes cannot magically change mediocrity to genius. Alright, I have a structure for my story. Now what? Rule 6. Maintain a focused narrative. It's the golden rule of essay writing to not venture too far away from one's thesis. To do so could easily break your argument and lead you to ending on an answer whose question was never asked. Kind of like starting your work by asking what the answer to 2 plus 2 is, and ending by revealing that your answer is yellow. Many a story have been ruined by a lack of focus. Like starting with a tale of world domination, one where a terrible villain has taken control and it's up to the plucky hero to lead a resistance and free the
the world once again. Only to halt the plot midway, introduce a love interest, and have the villain and his world domination scheme resolve neatly off screen. All while the promised tale of a hero toppling a terrible tyrant jackknifes into romance. And now, instead of following through on the initial conflict and seeing our hero storming the villain's evil lair, we're watching him meet his love interest's parents in a world that seems to have forgotten it had been conquered just a few days prior. In fact, this particular phenomenon seems to happen so often with independent works that I've begun affectionately calling it Sudden Romance Syndrome, where the main narrative feels like it wants to be somewhere else, but always shifts back to romance. Like if John Wick started his rampage of revenge against the man who killed his dog during the first half of the movie, then just started dating a new love interest, while the guy he wanted revenge against dies off screen somewhere. You're essentially starting a new story from scratch in the middle of the story. A good example of a focused narrative comes in the shape of Conan the Barbarian, specifically the narrative structure of the typical Conan story. After several trial runs with Conan and the Hyborian Age, Robert E. Howard managed to identify what elements intrigued his audience the most and set the formula for the Conan narrative. Conan, the strong warrior, interesting ruins for him to explore, a monster to fight, and a beautiful maiden to rescue. The Slithering Shadow is a good example of this formula at play. Conan, along with his buxom companion, stumble upon a strange city of Zuthal, which has been haunted by a monstrous demon named Thog. The goal of the narrative is for Conan to keep his companion safe and defeat the monster, and that's exactly what he does. While there is a love interest, the romantic elements of the tale never replace or overshadow the main story. To compare in terms of Freytag's triangle, everything before Conan arrives at the city of Zuthal is exposition. Encountering the mystery of the mysterious city is the inciting incident. The following exploration and the subsequent discoveries that follow make up the rising action. Presence of the demon Thog provides the complication. Conan engaging in brutal physical conflict with the monster is the climax. Conan slowly dying from his wounds is the falling action. And Conan being healed by the golden wine gives us our final resolution and denouement. Had the story come down to a case of sudden romance syndrome, we might see Conan enter Zuthal, learn about the demon, and then suddenly switch focus to Conan's relationship with his companion, Natala. Thog kind of fades out of the picture, and instead of a climactic battle against a vicious monster, Conan flees the city with Natala, and we suddenly begin a romance story. Keep the story simple, complete, and most importantly, focused. Okay, sure, sure. I'll keep a focused narrative. What's next? Rule 7. Maintain the willing suspension of disbelief. An absolute necessity, the heart of which is constantly under siege by the continuity is optional school of thought. Why? Because the willing suspension of disbelief is the unwritten agreement the audience agrees to when reading a story. They accept the existence of men who can fly, or aliens from Mars, or ancient curses. Things that don't normally make sense in the real world. However, the author has their own obligations in this agreement. And that obligation is to maintain the willing suspension of disbelief. The author must preserve an internal consistency within their own work. As mentioned earlier, setting up the rules of your universe can not only spark tension, mystery, and characterization, it also preserves the audience's suspension of disbelief by maintaining a string of logic and cause and effect in accordance with these rules. The official term for this element is verisimilitude, the appearance of being true or real. As described on Masterclass.com, a work of fiction with verisimilitude betrays situations, dialogue, and characters in a way that seems authentic and truthful despite the fact that those elements are made up. Or as Neil Gaiman described it, we're using memorable lies. We are taking people who do not exist and things that did not happen to those people in places that aren't. And we are using those things to communicate true things. In Little Red Riding Hood, we can believe a wolf can talk. In Star Wars, we can believe in the mysterious power known as the Force. In Lord of the Rings, we can believe in creatures like orcs and trolls and dark lords. Where suspension of disbelief begins to break is when the chain of cause and effect also breaks. This is why the critic's most common critiques often refers to inconsistencies in narrative, canon, continuity, and character. To put it simply, if we're told one thing and then we encounter a contradiction without a suitable explanation as to why, the story stops being believable. And when the story stops being believable, we have a major flaw in the narrative. And that's regardless of how many themes you try to stuff it with. It's no coincidence, perhaps, that so many Star Wars fans, desperate to reignite their love for the franchise, either outrightly despised Rey or became obsessed with finding out what famous Force user she was related to. Because the original Star Wars trilogy had spent three movies showing us that one required training in the Force in order to strengthen their control over the Force. When Rey started dominating brains and pulling lightsabers to her with no training at all, the only explanation that even remotely made sense, according to the rules of Star Wars, was that her lore-breaking natural skill in the Force was inherited by blood. While this wouldn't resolve Rey from her lack of training, an inherited power would at least be somewhat acceptable
acceptable, since it could be argued that Luke Skywalker likewise benefited from his father, Darth Vader. But without either, Rey's rule-breaking skill in the Force broke the willing suspension of disbelief for many a viewer. And this is how you get a divided fanbase. And not, contrary to popular opinion, because your work was simply too smart for your audience, and that they're just angry because they totally couldn't understand the themes of your brilliant masterpiece. As described by Masterclass, whether you're writing a grounded, realistic piece of fiction or science fiction epic, the appearance of truth is essential to good writing. Fiction writers need to know how to use verisimilitude in order to draw readers in by resembling reality. If a writer can't solve the problem of verisimilitude in their characters or details, readers will reject even the most exciting scenario. Make sure I follow my own rules, I gotta maintain internal consistency, and don't let my ego get in the way. I got it. What else do I need to know? Rule 8. Save revelations until dramatically impactful. This has likely been a major issue since the dawn of storytelling, but the ineffective info dump has become more noticeable with the rise in popularity of superhero stories. But this rule can pertain to any impactful event or piece of information. As mentioned by Patrick Rothfuss, the enthusiastic author can fall prey to poorly constructed info dumps, just a flood of facts, without any given reason why we need to know these facts. In The Empire Strikes Back, the evil Darth Vader revealing himself to be the father of series protagonist Luke Skywalker is one of the most memorable scenes in Star Wars history. By the time we arrive at our fateful twist, Luke has spent quite a while fighting the Empire, and for all that time, Darth Vader had been the face of the enemy. The face Luke could attach all the evils and cruelties of the Empire to. When the Empire burned his uncle's farm, when they blew up Alderaan, when they captured his friends and tortured Han Solo, it was the face of Darth Vader that had come to represent every one of these atrocities. So when Luke is lying helpless at the mercy of Darth Vader and lamenting the loss of his hand, learning that the face of evil was also the face of his father, this final revelation shocked the audience and mentally crushed Luke Skywalker. Had Luke's mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, revealed the information to Luke Skywalker at the beginning of the first movie, the impact would be greatly diminished. Luke had no personal history with Darth Vader or the Rebellion at that point, no friends to defend. The information might be interesting, but without the build-up, the history, and seeing the atrocities of Darth Vader, without the meaning behind it, that's all it would be. A simple revelation with no significant impact. Some writers of indie superhero fiction might feel compelled to give us an origin story in an opening info dump, or making the opening portion of the story everything up until the incident. Daredevil getting chemicals in his eyes, Batman losing his parents, Spider-Man getting bit by a radioactive spider. In some cases, however, it seems as if authors toss in the origin story for the same reason a student does his homework, because they have to. Every good superhero story must begin with their origin, right? Well, that's not entirely accurate. The only thing the author is obligated to tell us is what we need to know for the plot. Introduce the hero, even if you don't have his origin story set yet. Take that first adventure or first few adventures and work backwards. If the hero uses martial arts or a special technique, ask yourself, where did he get his training? Why? Why would he want to learn in the first place? Because after having seen your hero's extraordinary skill, the audience will be asking the same thing. This is, of course, when you reveal that the hero's mentor had been the evil mastermind pulling the strings from the shadows the entire time. Or, how many times have you heard the question, do we really need to see Bruce Wayne's parents killed again? The short answer is no. The long answer is not unless it's central to the plot. For example, Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins made good use of the Wayne's murder by having it drive Bruce Wayne into becoming the Batman, which then cast Cascades into the main events of the movie. The original Batman story began with Batman tackling a criminal conspiracy, and all with no sign of an origin story. We simply followed an extraordinary character and his extraordinary adventures. And while Daredevil's initial outing included his origin story, the plot revolves around the event that sparked his journey into heroism. Daredevil's task is to take down the criminal known as the Fixer. We see his father, a professional boxer, make a deal with the Fixer. He would lose fights in exchange for a large payoff, a payoff that he only took because he wanted to provide for his blind son. One night, Daredevil's father decides to win the fight for fear of disappointing his son. This resulted in the Fixer killing him in retaliation, and this, of course, inspired little Matt Murdock to train into Daredevil and avenge his father. So while the origin story was included, it was central to the plot, to introducing the villain, and to learning what made the story's villain so evil. Daredevil's first adventure is particularly interesting because it doesn't actually begin with the origin story. Instead, we begin by seeing Daredevil fighting the Fixer's men. The origin story doesn't show up until the middle, and by then, not only is the origin now dramatically relevant, since it shows a 
us why the mysterious Daredevil is fighting these men, but the audience is likely intrigued to know who Daredevil is and how he developed these skills. In summary, refrain from assaulting your audience with meaningless information dumps. This is like giving us an answer to a question you never ever asked. Almost like going to class and listening to Professor drone on endlessly about something you don't care about. Instead, ask the question first and then, while your audience is potentially intrigued, answer the question. That's the essence of dramatic relevance. Making the information relevant to the plot and dropping said information when your audience would care about it the most. Okay, I got it, I got it. But I keep hearing a lot of people complain about propaganda and Mary Sue's. Is there any way I can, um, avoid that? Rule 9. Write honestly. This is a core problem during the era of media where franchises like Star Wars and Marvel Comics began demonizing their own fans. When stories stop focusing on telling stories and instead focuses on painting something or someone as universally monstrous through lies and exaggeration, it starts to lose its credibility, its honesty. Probably one of the most infamous instances of this is when Marvel Comics writer Ta Nisi Coates turned Jordan Peterson, a professor who built his brand on personal growth and self-improvement, into the dastardly Red Skull, a Marvel rogue and a literal Nazi. Coates tells his readers that Jordan Peterson is evil and that all who believe his philosophy of self-improvement were lost, selfish, or misguided. Probably because, if left to think for themselves, the audience might find themselves agreeing with Dr. Peterson's brand of philosophy. And this is how you get propaganda. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. In the words of Neil Gaiman, I would much rather not tell you how to feel about something. I would rather you just felt it. I will tell you what happens, and if I leave you crying because I killed a unicorn, I'm not going to tell you how sad the death of the unicorn was. I'm going to kill that unicorn, and I'm going to break your heart. When the author stops telling their tale and begins telling you what to think or feel, the honesty shatters and the audience is stripped of their autonomy. Stories could arguably be described as a kind of conversation between writer and reader. When a writer's story lacks honesty, when the chain of cause and effect is broken and the internal logic shatters, or it's trying to dictate how you should feel, it's as if you've suddenly found yourself locked in conversation with a liar. Like when your catch potato friend tells you about the time he beat up 10 bikers in a bar, and that's why he couldn't show up to your birthday party. Or how someone's nine-year-old totally said something profound about socioeconomics or something. It's difficult to invest in a story that's such an obvious lie. As stated by DC and Marvel Comics writer Brian Michael Bendis, the best advice I can give is to write honestly. You want to give people what they want? They want your honesty. They want your best. They want to be moved. They want to be surprised and delighted. They want to know that the person writing has something real and interesting to say. As mentioned earlier, it's true that stories tend to be lies, a series of untrue events, but a core element of good storytelling is a perfected craft, and one of the foundational elements of good writing craft is verisimilitude, the art of believability, maintaining the willful suspension of disbelief, telling a story in such a way that the audience can imagine it truly happening. This means maintaining believability. This is the same problem that plagues the Mary Sue, a character with illogical power. A character who everyone loves, even if they should hate them. A character to whom the rules of the universe bend to appease. Just like propaganda, and just like a story that breaks its own logic, a Mary Sue is an obvious lie. A character that breaks verisimilitude. That's also why so many self-inserts turn into Mary Sues. An author wanting to experience a fantasy of being the best or most beautiful without the petty inconvenience of earning it. The author might be tempted to give their stand-in character certain traits that defy the logic of their world like giving them superhuman strength in a world without superhuman powers, or writing themselves as correct, even if the character lacks all the necessary information to arrive at the correct conclusion. Just as dishonest stories tend to tell the audience what to think and feel, the Mary Sue exists to tell you how to feel about a character, how much you should love them, how cool they are, how totally empowering they are. To again quote Neil Gaiman, this may not be true for every other writer out there, but it's true for this writer. You have to make it as honest as you can, because that's what people respond to. Okay. Okay, so stay honest and make sure to tell a story and let the audience think for themselves, okay? But what if I can't get the... Uh, what if I get... What if I can't seem to get inspired to write? Rule 10. The muse is a luxury. When one chooses to move from writing stories as a hobby to writing for a living, one unfortunately also surrenders the luxury of waiting for inspiration. Just like with any other job, you need to produce. In other words, you no longer have the option of just waiting around, simply telling everyone that you're writing a novel. You actually have to do it now. The genius artist waiting around for the next era-defining novel to pop into their head and then is whisked off to eternal stardom is a common romantic ideal, but not a practical one. It's barely even a feasible one. 
Robert E. Howard, who is today mostly known as the writer of Conan the Barbarian, managed to craft a considerable collection of works during his 10 years of writing. 28 Conan stories, 14 Call of Atlantis stories, 16 Solomon Cain stories, 9 stories about Bran Mock Morn, King of the Picts, 5 stories about Turlaw Dub O'Brien, 8 James Allison stories, and 14 other assorted fantasy stories, which comes to around 94 in total. And that's not including the 100 or so fictional stories he penned and definitely not including the impressive roster of strictly historical stories Howard also wrote. In fact, it was fairly common for a pulp writer to have a plethora of written works under their belts. They needed to put food on the table, and they did that by selling a story to the publisher. As Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling put it, moments of pure inspiration are glorious, but most of a writer's life is, to adapt the old cliche, about perspiration rather than inspiration. Sometimes you have to write even when the muse isn't cooperating. When you write for a living, there's no time to wait for a muse to whisper the perfect story in to your ear. One can't usually just tell the store checkout clerk that you're broke and that you'll totally pay him back as soon as your writing career takes off. In short, a professional writer must replace the romantic idea of a muse with discipline. If you know your craft, if you know how stories are constructed, and you tell us an honest and an intriguing tale that maintains our willing suspension of disbelief, then you've done your job. As Neil Gaiman said, if you're only going to write when you're inspired, you may be a fairly decent poet, but you will never be a novelist, because you're going to have to make your word count today. And and those words aren't going to wait for you, whether you're inspired or not. It's easy to get lost in the romantic idea of being a writer, but expenses wait for no man, and waiting for the fickle muse would be like rolling dice to see if you can eat that month. You can't always rely on inspiration, but you can always rely on your craft. Hmm, that's right, huh? That sounds a little scary to me. What if I change my mind about the story? What if I keep making mistakes? Rule 11. Never fear mistakes. Writing is scary. There's no real way around it, and a lot of the fear of being a writer tends to stem from the idea of imperfection, that someone will find fault or simply tear it to pieces. Good writers put a lot of their heart and themselves into their work, and to many, the thought of exposing said work to even the slightest possibility of negative critique can be far too overwhelming to overcome. So overwhelming, in fact, that they never take the plunge, and writing a novel forever remains a dream. As J.K. Rowling said, fear of failure is the saddest reason on earth not to do what you are meant to do. I finally found the courage to start submitting my first books to agents and publishers at a time when I felt a conspicuous failure. Only then did I decide that I was going to try this one thing that I always suspected I could do, and if it didn't work out, well, I'd faced worse and survived. The fear writer's experience never truly goes away. In fact, if the fear isn't there, it's very likely because you're writing something that carries no meaning to you. The fear is good. It means you're invested. But as as Rowling mentioned, writing takes courage. Courage enough to expose your heart to the unfeeling and often cruel masses, and then keep going. Never be afraid of mistakes. In the words of No Country for Old Men author Cormac McCarthy, writing is rewriting. Someone said easy writing makes for hard reading. Whether one is the type to plan out their stories or is a discovery writer, the type to take an idea and run without planning anything beforehand, rewriting is essential. When on your first draft, write boldly. Make mistakes. Craft scenes that seem right, but but may not make sense. Have your characters say exactly what you want them to say. Give us twists and turns that could never ever happen. Write your Mary Sue's. The first draft is where you set up the skeleton of your story. Your goal here is getting to the end. The second draft is when you fix all the things that don't make sense. This is where you cut unnecessary scenes or add scenes that fix the narrative. Give your Mary Sue struggles and flaws and place hints of later events early on in the story so when the big events do eventually arrive, they arrive organically and not out of nowhere. In other words, this is when you make it look like you knew what you were doing the entire time. Or as Neil Gaiman phrased it, the question, what is this about, is what gets you from the first draft to the second draft, because what you're then doing is you're going, okay, in which case what I have to do now is buttress what the story is about and eliminate those places where I'm writing stuff that isn't what the story is about, and it gives you just a wonderful easy yardstick for what stays in and what goes out. Never fear imperfection. The cold truth is that no story is perfect. Even after your second draft, there will be flaws of one nature or another, perhaps even glaring ones. But that fact isn't the curse it might appear to be, because imperfection is something that plagues all creative works, and that includes published authors. Even the biggest names and most beloved storytellers make mistakes, but each one decided to take the plunge anyway. Contrary to popular belief, imperfection isn't what keeps writers from writing, getting published, or achieving their dreams. That role falls to inaction. 
question. To again recall the words of J.K. Rowling, ultimately, wouldn't you rather be the person who actually finished the project you're dreaming about, rather than the one who always talks about always having wanted to? And no matter how perfect one gets their work, there will always be those who feel disappointed. In fact, comic book writer Brian Michael Bendis gave an interesting story on the matter. To quote, Early in every semester of the college class I teach, I ask my students to bring their absolute favorite and their absolute least favorite comic books or graphic novels. Interestingly enough, there hasn't been one semester where a student hasn't brought up a certain graphic novel as their favorite, while another student brought the exact same graphic novel as their least favorite. Quite often, one of my students will bring in two graphic novels, one they hate and one they love, both from the very same author. So the fear of imperfection will always be there. But if I'm going to be a writer, I can't let it stop me. I just gotta remember why I wanted to write in the first place. You know, besides the money and the fame. Because I want to move the people with my stories. But how do I know when I'm ready? Rule 12. Find your voice. Like a child mimicking their teachers when first learning how to do something, most writers begin their journey into writing by mimicking their favorite authors. As Neil Gaiman once noted, most of us find our own voices only after we've sounded like a lot of other people. But what does that mean exactly? In the early 2000s, DC Comics released a series that reimagined the stories of popular DC heroes like Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman as if the original concepts were given to Stan Lee. Tim Burton made his own reimagined imagining of popular stories like Planet of the Apes and Alice in Wonderland. Not to mention Quentin Tarantino becoming so known for his particular style of storytelling that the term Tarantino-esque can sometimes be used to describe a movie, and the avid moviegoer may very well recognize what that means. Tarantino's use of dialogue, style of action, character, and character interactions are all uniquely and identifiably his. And the same could be said about Stan Lee and Tim Burton. The style, elements, the characters, topics, and especially their way of writing each of these elements are just some of the parts of what make up the voice of each creator. When you wonder what a Tarantino Star Trek or a Tim Burton Star Wars, or better yet, a Stanley Batman would be like, you're actually wondering how that particular story would sound if told in the unique voice of that creator. Now some might ask, if we begin by copying the voices of authors we admire, how do we find our own? Easy. Writing is a craft like any other, and just like any other craft, despite what the subjectivist school of thought might say, story craft requires practice. Many fledgling writers have allowed themselves to be deluded by the romantic idea of writing their very first story and immediately setting the world on fire with their genius. And so many writers tend to surrender their writing dream when their first project fails to spark the reaction they intended or most likely spark any positive reaction at all. While anyone can write, writing well is a skill that requires perfecting. And that perfecting requires trial and error. To again reference Neil Gaiman, after you you've written 10,000 words, 30,000 words, 60,000 words, 150,000 words, a million words, you will have your voice. Because your voice is the stuff you can't help doing. And this is ultimately the main thing any aspiring writer needs to remember. One can study and remember every piece of writing advice, lesson, or tutorial they've ever heard. But just like in martial arts, one can learn a roster of techniques, but they won't be much use when the time comes without a chance to practice. Write. Learn. Make mistakes. Spend those 10,000, 30,000, or million words you spend finding your voice, expelling all the bad stories from your metaphorical pen. In the words of Cormac McCarthy, even if what you're working on doesn't go anywhere, it will help you get to the next thing you're doing. Make yourself available for something to happen. Give it a shot. Now, on to the final rule. Hey, ain't there just supposed to be 12 rules? What's this one supposed to be, eh? Secret rule 13. Never give up. This isn't so much a rule for writing as much as it is a rule for writing success. In fact, forgetting this rule is what stops a great many people from achieving their dreams. Some try and then walk away after their first rejection letter, as if a simple rejection is proof enough that they could never succeed as a creative, never realizing that rejection is less of a definitive failure and more of a rite of passage for any aspiring writer. J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, which eventually made her a billionaire, was rejected 12 times before finally given a chance. Frank Herbert's Dune was rejected 20 times before finally considered. So many believe the secret to writing is talent, which isn't true at all. At best, talent might give you a head start, but talent is meaningless without the will to utilize it. In short, the true secret to writing is persistence, a tireless pursuit of craft, story, and publication. A hypothetical told to comic book artist and writer Joe Quesada by his teacher Mr. Arisman perfectly illustrates the virtue of persistence and why talent isn't everything.
To quote, one morning he started the class by telling us an ugly truth, that, on average, after graduating, only three or four of us would end up working professionally as illustrators. Needless to say, that shocked a theater filled with well over a hundred students. I mean, it was understandable. We felt we were hearing that only a handful of us might actually make it. Not only would a minuscule percentage of us actually make it, but also being the most talented person in the class had little to nothing to do with that outcome. Mr. Arisman went on to tell us this story of two fictional artists, both from the same graduating class, one whom we'll call Artist A is brilliantly talented and innovative, the envy of all, and the other, Artist B, while not without talent, isn't someone whose work would normally stand out from the pack. The day after graduation, they both hit the bricks and start showing their portfolios around town. Not surprisingly, they get rejected on their first attempts, and on their second and third tries as well. It's going to happen. It happens to everyone. The odds are stacked against them. More portfolio reviews bring more rejections, and what slowly becomes evident is that Artist A is getting discouraged and starts to doubt his talent. More importantly, he doesn't ask the right questions. What can I learn from this? How do I make it better? Artist B, on the other hand, isn't letting rejection break him. Sure, it stings, but it's the process, and he's not giving up. By the 50th rejection, Artist A has had enough. He's not cut out for this line of work. The rejection is just too painful and personal. By the 60th rejection, Artist B still has no significant work to speak of, but he's learned a lot about the business in the process. He's He's met a lot of people, and he's looked at each rejection not as a personal affront, but as a learning experience. That's not to say that rejection doesn't get him down, but now he has the ability to shake it off and he doesn't let it define him. The path of the writer is rife with vile temptations and pitfalls. More people want to have written than those willing to do the writing. And so people fall in love with the romantic idea of writing their novel and being instantly showered in riches and fame, perhaps driven by the misconception that writing is relatively effortless. And reality sets when they learn that good writing takes good craft, and good craft takes practice. It takes study and discipline and humility. It takes honesty and passion and persistence. But perhaps most of all, it takes courage. Courage enough to take that first step, and courage enough to face the storm, to follow that dream, and never ever let go.